Cool, thanks, Pierre. Is this volume okay? Can everyone hear me? Am I booming too loud? Okay, rock on now. Um, yeah, so the, list, the talk's called um, Dare Transforming Your Sewage into Signatures, um, which sounds cool, but there's some truth in that as well. Um, I'd like to start things off with a quote. Um, everyone's seen the, the movie The Firm, like an old uh, um, Tom Cruise movie from the 90s. And it's basically about uh, Tom Cruise, like his up and coming lawyer, and he joins this like small firm, but they um, have like tons of cash and like these really important clients. Um, and it turns out they're basically like they, they, the lawyers for the mafia. And um, they have a security guy there who's basically like is, is the opsec, opsec guy called uh, Bill Davendish, um, and he's suspicious about Tom Cruise. So he, so he says to like the owner of the, of the firm the one day, you know, like this guy's probably gonna watch out. And the guy says, man, why are you being suspicious? There's, there's nothing, nothing about. And he says to him. I get paid to be suspicious when there's nothing to be suspicious about, which I think really like encapsulates what we do in security, right? Um, so that's me. Um, I'm from Africa, so that's my chicken, named Vivian. Um, <laughs> um, I've been in InfoSec for about uh, seven years. Before that, I was a musician, I tried to be one. It's hard to feed your family to doing that. Um, after that, I was an investment banker for, two, for a year, which is... Um, a really hard industry. It's uh, if you think, think we ever have moral problems, like that's a different story if you're uh, in banking. It's not not a great place to be. Uh, I've got a master's in computer science and infosec. Uh, I've worked for, for a bank for a couple of years, and right now I'm a security analyst uh, specializing in intelligence uh, at SensePost uh, South Africa. And I'm a husband and a cat and dog lover. So things that interest me, um, security intelligence, incident response, um, and all matter of things blue. Um, I'm not a pen tester, even though I work for a pen testing firm, which is weird, don't tell them. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm a defensive guy through and through. It's kind of what gets me going. And if you want to get hold of me, like those are the ways, Twitter's probably the easiest, I think. Um, but if you remember what IRC is I'm on Atrium, hit me up there. Um, or my blog, which updates infrequently. All right, so getting into it, right? I like having some structure to my, to my slides. Not for you, mostly for me, otherwise I get lost. So uh, um, I split into five chapters, right? First chapter is uh, around more of like the foundation of where this talk's going, uh, around some controls. Chapter two, it's more about like the framework and how it fits together. Chapter three is a history slide, just we all get on the same page. Uh, and chapter four is kind of where the fun starts. Um, and then chapter five is just for lols. You'll see when we get there. <clears throat> but first, so um, this stuff here over here is called a uh, hockey's delight, which is a South African moonshine, basically. Uh, it's made from um, peaches, amarilla, lychee, and pineapple. Um, so if you're allergic to any of those things, keep that in mind. Um, and the whole idea here is like I'm going to be asking questions and like I try and get like, a bit of a dialogue going. So to incentivize that, and since we have Brucon, if you ask a question, you answer a question I'm, I'm, I'm asking around. Uh, Matt will help me out, handle a shot glass. We can't shoot in this room because it's old. Uh, I've just been told this, this building is one year older than Belgium itself, so I don't want to be spilling stuff on the floor. Um, but we'll get together after the bar and we'll just uh, we'll do some shots. It'll be cool. So chapter one, uh, the defensive toolbox. So as, as defenders, we've been told that um, you layer things, right? It's defense in depth. There's lots of things. You, uh, and you, you're never quite done. You just keep piling them on top of each other, right? Um, it's like antivirus. We all, all know how antivirus works. Um, and just to, to kind of distill it down to its core concept, um, it's a signature-based system, right? So you, um, you give it a DAT file. The DAT file's got signatures or known malicious things. Um, antivirus then sits wherever, if it's a network antivirus or uh, normally on the endpoint, and it looks for those malicious type of snippets. If it, f if it matches something that it knows is bad, flags is bad, you know, quarantines it or, you know, pops up a dialogue which you can ignore, whatever the case is, right? And we get intrusion detection systems, IDSs or IPSs, the prevention side of it, um, and they actually work very similarly, right? Also, you configure it with the uh, um, signatures, so someone has gone out and said, these things are known bad, known malicious things. Um, if you see these things, flag them off, send an alert or prevent it or whatever, I mean, however it's, it's, um, 
it's configured. But the core concept is very similar to how antivirus works, right? You have a, you have a set of known bad things, and you apply that to things you see coming into the, into the control. And you get firewalls, which might not be as obvious that it's also in the same kind of category, but actually it really is, right? Because you, you set up a rule base. And um, all your rule base is saying is, like, I know what is good, and therefore I know what is bad, right? So you're taking, a, again, a known bad, and you're configuring and saying these things don't, shouldn't be connecting, right? So if you look at like a web server, have a web server on your network, you, um, you have a firewall in front of it, you say, cool, only allow port 443 into the web server. And what you're basically saying is you're creating a signature that says, if you see anything that isn't 443, just drop it off. Don't let it come onto this, onto this machine. So if you take those, those three controls, right, I like to group them into what I call a decision through the detection security model, right? Or DTD. And the whole principle around is that you have a, a known, a, something that's no, known as malicious, and you draw decisions based on that, right? It's like antivirus ha has its DAT file, so it decides based on that file what to, what to quarantine. And uh, IPS, same thing, right? Based on what the uh, signatures are, it blocks things off. But on the other side of that thing, right, you have honeypots, which work in an entirely different type of security model. So uh, Honeypot just quickly sits on a piece of unused space, like an IP address, um, and it just sits and listens, or accepts connections, or depending on how it's configured, right? Um, but it doesn't have a, a predefined set of, of signatures that it matches for, or it doesn't have like a, a rule base, I mean, strictly speaking, at its, at its core function, right? It sits there on something that doesn't have any business use, and anything that connects to it, the assumption is that if you are talking to a honeypot, you shouldn't be talking to it, so therefore why are you talking to anything on my network, right? So how I label those things are um, um, presence-based controls, right? Or the decision through presence, where the decision that's made by the control is based on the presence of something being or coming into the control, um, so DTP. So I like, so those are like the two groups of security controls, right? So, so you get the the presence ones and the detection ones. So honeypots are quite new, right? I mean, not, not new, but they are not as well known as like antiviruses. So I like, um, I like to go through a bit of history, history of how they work. Um, it kind of sets the tone of how, um, where they came from and the rest of it, right? So 1991 is probably the earliest example of a, of a honeypot. Um, uh, Cheswick at AT&T Labs uh, back in 91, he, um, he wrote a bogus system which looked like it exposed a bug in SendMail where you could basically do a remote file inclusion. Um, and you could send SendMail, send SendMail some stuff and it would try, it would mail you a file back. And the attack at the time was it would mail you back the password file, crack the password offline, log in, right? So he wrote a system which kind of looked like it had this um, and then he got an attacker trying to, tie, trying to um, exploit that same, that same vulnerability. Um, and it, it was very manual, so it basically alerted him when someone tried it, and then he had to manually do the rest. So he like manually logged in, sent over a password file, and he could kind of like, he got to the stage after like, I don't know how long it was, I think it was a couple of months, he could recognize this particular attacker attacking other systems that he had um, access to based on how he or she was interfacing with the system or how they were typing. Um, and that whole story actually got rolled into a book by Clifford Stoll called The Cuckoo's Egg, which is uh, which quite popular. Um, then in 98, the first commercial version of a honeypot was released. It was released by Network Associates, and it was part of their uh, CyberCop Sting, probably the buzzword of the time, um, suite of products. And it was, it was marketed as an emulation system that would um, confuse attackers trying to attack your network, right? And they would be stuck in these honeypots for days instead of going after your, your, your actual assets. Um, and you think about it, I mean, that's 15 years ago, nothing's really changed from what the brief around the honeypot is. I mean, it's, it's very similar still. Um, then uh, in 1999, uh, Fred Cohn released what they call the Deception Toolkit, which is a bunch of Perl scripts. Um, and the, the, the great thing about that was it was a pure open source project, right? And it kind of allowed the community to kind of get dirty with um, honeypot technology um, without going through huge development process. It was right there, like any, any other open source product, right? Um, and then this, the real big push was by uh, Lance Spit in 1999, um, who, and he released HoneyNet, um, which has become the Honey Project now, which he backs. And 
it's kind of like been the, the cornerstone of almost all honeypot work uh, from then. So you get two kinds of honeypots at a greater sense, right? You get low interaction ones and high interaction ones. Um, and it kind of relates to how they interface with data. Um, or, so there's two ways, right? There's, a, there's honeypots collect data and they control data. So they control data by exposing services or exposing, I mean, services is very generic to a network term, but like exposing things to an attacker to try and lure them in. Um, and then they collect data um, whereby obviously anything that comes in to try and research later. So it's a, it's a data control and a data collect system. And you classify it as high or low depending on how verbosely it does those two things. Um, so some examples, um, Kippo, which is quite common and quite an old SSH honeypot. It's a low interaction one because um, it doesn't have a full stack. It basically just um, opens port 22, has a small like pseudo back end to it. So if you log into it, um, it has some functions, but nothing really beyond the simple logging in on SSH. And the whole purpose there is um, you want to try and see who's logging in and what accounts they're trying to use, right? Someone's like found some accounts that think are relevant to your subnet. Um, and, if, and if you have a Kippo honeypot, the guys will log in there, use their accounts there, and you can like, get a, a head start on what accounts have been breached on your, your, um, your domain. Um, then um, an older version of that, actually, or an older version of a honeypot was like the old spam relay set by, by uh, anti-spam companies. They open up an open relay server. Um, and uh, in the old days, not so much anymore, really, because like, spam isn't really such a big problem anymore. Um, Guys just look for open relay servers and it was still quite common. They'd find one and just like load it up and just like spamming through it. And the idea of a honeypot um, spam relay was that they'd set these things up themselves and then they would assume any mail coming through that spam, um, that spam honeypot was already spam and they'd hash that and send it straight off to the anti-spam mechanism. So they would be able to classify spam at source before it got crowdsourced by other people reporting it as spam. Um, other cool ones and the version of a, of a, of a high interaction honeypot um, was Sebek, which now became Cubic um, after it got, um, had stack redone. Uh, it sits on actual real virtual machines, right? So there's an actual, like a real TCP stack behind it, a real OS stack. Um, and that will really differentiate a high interaction from a low interaction is that um, there's a high degree of complexity around what the honeypot actually is. Um, and then there's a middle ground between them, which is called like a, a medium interaction, but I, I, I like calling them uh, goal-based or goal-focused honeypots, um, where it almost looks high interaction based on the, um, the complexity behind the honeypot, but it only looks for one specific thing, right? So the, there's a honeypot called a Trigona, which its sole purpose is to, is to pull down um, malware payloads. Um, so it has, a, it, has a, it has a TCP stack that's mature enough to accept a initial exploit from a botnet. It will then do a botnet um, uh, talk back to the CNC server to the point where it gets the final malware payload, right? And at that point, we'll save the connection, save the malware down for analysis later. So it's quite a complex stack, but it's not a full-on VM, right? It's just it's still at a, at a pseudo um, stack basis. Um, other kinds of honeypots, which are not not really honeypots in the, in the purest sense, um, but they kind of fit into it. One is um, honey tokens, also um, uh, popularized by Lancepit. And the idea there is that it's a piece of information which has no value, right? So um, the easiest example, if you look at, look at the database, okay? You have a database somewhere and you create a table called director salaries. Um, and you know that if, anyone tries to attach or tries to access that database on that database table, um, there's no reason for them to be doing it because there's, no, it, there's no real data inside. It's only there as an enticing um, target for someone who's trolling around in the SQL database. Um, another example of those are credit card numbers that they place into, um, into big credit card databases. And they know that these credit cards aren't issued to anyone. They shouldn't be moved. Um, they should never transact. So if anything comes across the line on those numbers, something's gone wrong, right? Like, Something's been breached, but that never happens, so it's cool. Um, and then another interesting one is called Libria, which is also refers to the Tarpit honeypot. Um, it was written specifically as a response to, to the code Redworm, which sped at an incre incredible speed when it, was, um, when it was running. And the idea was that 
um, a Libri honeypot would sit and wait for a code red worm to connect to it, and it would acknowledge the connection, respond to the connection, but it would feed data to the code, code red worm in very, very slow increments, basically locking the code red worm down uh, and not allowing it to move to any other targets while I just basically sat there feeding it bits, bits, bits. Um, um, so then, summarizing quickly, right? There's two security models. There's, there's a detection one and a presence one. Um, detection ones rely on known malicious stuff being, being um, configured up front um, and consist of like antivirus, firewalls, IPSs. Uh, and the presence ones rely on um, unused IT space, right? Something that you can, like, that you can kind of throw away with, any, with no real business use. Uh, and are characterized by honeypots. Cool, chapter two. So, as they say in Thailand, DTD and DTP are like same, same, but different, right? They're very similar in lots of regards, but there are subtle differences. Um, and the easiest way I've found to kind of like look at those differences um, is to, to break them up into two distinct phases, right? A discovery phase and an action phase. Now, both, the both of the detection and the um, presence controls, but they both have a discovery phase and they both have an action phase, but they kind of do them in a, in a different way. Um, and what I find helps is looking at them on a costing basis, right? So what does it cost to do each phase for each control? So you look at the discovery phase for a, for a detection-based system, right? Um, you have, I'm going to read it out and I'll talk about it now. You have the total cost of research, right? Divide by N, where N is nodes. And you add to that the distribution cost times by the amount of nodes you have. Right, so if you, think, if you think about it in terms of antivirus, and I keep going back to it, but it's a really easy example to talk to. Um, you have antivirus, and someone has to figure out what the, what the known malicious bad is, right? So someone has to do some research. Someone has to go and write those DAT files. Um, and so that total cost of research is really that, the cost of someone sitting there, clunking away, writing signatures, right? Um, but the cool thing about it is that you only do it once, right? You only write those signatures once, and then you can distribute it amongst n amounts of nodes. So if you have um, one client for antivirus, then every, every, every pound you spend writing, um, writing research is only for that one node. But if you have 10 nodes, it doesn't really increase the amount of time you spend doing research, but you now can, can basically divide that work over, over those 10 nodes. Um, in the profitability mode, right? And then there's a certain cost as to what it takes to distribute those signatures to those nodes. Um, luckily, we live in the future where internets are really cheap most of the place. So I normally take distribution cost and I wipe it to zero because uh, it doesn't really cost anything to update anything, right? Then if you look at the second phase, which is the action phase, right? Um, and here I, I cost this being um, the amount of nodes times the false positive rate. Um, and it's almost an inverse to the, to the, um, the research side, right? So, so like, give me an example, right? So you, you, can be on, you can be writing signatures for an IPS, okay? And you can sit there and you can say, you know, I've seen most malware uses TCP. So I'm going to make my life easy and just say oh, everything TCP is malware. Pfft, easy. One signature to rule them all, right? And while that brings down your cost um, on, the, on the research side severely, you pay a penalty at the action side um, with false positive, because every single thing coming down the line, coming through the IPS, is going to be kicked off, right? So you basically, you, you pay the price of being a crappy researcher in the action phase um, based on a, on a heavy, heavy research distribution model, right? Um, and there's a middle ground to walk, obviously, you know? So if you go out and, if you go out and buy a piece of antivirus, um, if I install it on my Windows machine at home or someone else installs it on their Windows machine uh, in America, it's the same signature base, right? And it's the same piece of um, endpoint, secure, endpoint software. Um, so they have, to, they have to have some generalization to make it relevant to, to a lot of people, but they can't make it too generalized, otherwise they end up at a point where it starts flagging you know, uh, system files as being bad, which also never happens, of course. So a great example of that is McAfee, right? They've built an entire business doing that. You, know, you can walk into a store in Belgium, buy a McAfee off the shelf, or download, I suppose, these days. Uh, you can do the same in America, and it's exactly the same product everywhere. Um, and what it gives you is great economies of scale, right? So you have 
a situation where because you can distribute your research across so many nodes, you have an economies of scale which allows you to build business models um, like, like McAfee does. Um, but going back to the phases, right? If you look at like the discovery and the action phase, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the discovery phase, right? So from a costing point of view, that's quite hard work. But on the action phase, it's simply just taking that research and saying, yep, that's bad, quarantine it. So from a, from a cost point of view, it's much cheaper um, on a detection side to go into the action phase. So like I always think about, about um, detection stuff as being, as being that. So who, who can tell me who that is? Anyone? Tony Montana, cool. Matt, give the man a shot glass. <laughs> Tony Montana from Scarface, right? And um, if you remember the movie, he basically uh, um, was really good killing things with an M16, right? And that, that's, how, that's how I think about antiviruses. There's a lot, there's, like, they do a lot of work up front, but they really get really good at actioning things, right? Once you get to the action phase, it's, it, there's no thought process involved. It gets, it gets done straight away. So compare that to the presence, the, the, the presence base controls. Um, so like the, the cost of discovery there is basically if I, and where I is the existence of information. Because you're sitting on the unused piece of IP space, you can say, if I see something coming in, it's probably bad, right? And that is, your, that is the entire decision of discovery. That is how you decide if something is, is going to be, um, is discovered by honeypots, right? And that's very, very, very low cost. It costs you an IP address, really. Um, you know, and like the value of a IP version 4 IP address these days is a bit different than it used to be. Um, but I still don't think it's enough to break the bank. But if you move over to the action phase, things get a lot more complex, right? So I say it here as, as kids, I, I is incident, right? Where incident is something coming into the honeypot. So um, you take that and you times it by threshold, where threshold is the point where you start caring, caring about what's coming into the honeypot. So, you know, if you're getting... Let's say you're getting like a, a thousand incidents, um, and you say, cool, I only really care about stuff that has this type of characteristic, right? You're not, you whittle it down a bit, that's the threshold. But then for every single one of those incidents, you still need to research them, right? So you times it by the total, cost, the total research cost per incident, and you times that by every node you have. So if you have 10 honeypots, it's 10 times more work opposed to one honeypot, um, which makes scaling properly difficult. Um, and get very, very expensive, and it's all, it's all human time, right? I mean, to do research on, on an instant, it's, I mean, you can use cuckoo box and things like that, but at the end of the day, it, it's a very time-intensive and normally a very human-intensive um, process. Um, so, going back to the movie analogies, right? Um, when I think about presence models, I think about this dude here. Like, who can tell me who that is? Anyone, 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 please. For free alcohol. <laughs> uh, so that's Patrick Jane from The Mentalist, right? And um, if you haven't watched The Mentalist, which I'm assuming no one has since no one's answered me, um, he, uh, he basically, uh, in the show, helps the police um, as a mentalist um, through social engineering and through uh, micro-expression stuff to kind of read, read criminals, right? And um, the whole premise of the show is that he can walk, walk into a situation and say, that dude's lying, you're not really who you say you are, and you killed that person because of this, right? So, uh, but he's a bit of a coward. So he, he's very good like, at like, um, saying what's going on, but then when like, the guns come out, he's like out the door first. Um, and that, that's very similar to what presence is, right? So in the discovery phase, it's almost like magic. Just because something appears and it's there, um, the honeypot's like, yeah, man, that's it. I, I, I found something. It's this. Um, but when you actually need to action something, it's very, very hard. And that's why I like the, the Patrick Jane analogy around that. So right, again, to summarize, um, detection stuff, great at economies of scale, and, um, and, and really good action at the action phase, yeah, I think Tony, Tony Montana, um, whereas presence, horrible at scaling. Um, it's like pure linear amount of um, effort needed per extra node added, um, but really good at discovery phase, right? So I, I did this research as part of an, another piece of work, right? And I came to the decision that, like, I've got two models, right, and two sets of controls. Um, they are very similar, and the one does one thing really well, and the other one does something else really well. 
And it would be really cool if I can hack the two together and just have one model that does both things epically cool. I mean, that's the dream, right? Um, and I, I said, like, it, like, if you have like a, a hybrid model where both the, both the action and discovery are both very strong, kind of like this dude, right? Where like the detection is magic by itself, um, and uh, he'll still punch you in the face or hit you in the face with a cane. So that, that, that was really how the, the hybrid model came about, right? Trying to build something which has both the, the strong aspects of the presence, the presence side and the detection side. <clears throat> and that's Amber. So Amber's the name of the honeypot I built, which kind of tried to build that hybrid um, security, security uh, model. Um, and it's also the name of that cool South African gin, which is made from uh, the Thainbos Botanicals in Cape Town. Uh, it's a cool color and tastes quite nice as well. Um, so the idea was that Amber would use the, the um, action phase from detection and would use the discovery phase from, pres from presence, right? And if you draw, draw it out with nice blocks, I like colors, it kind of look like that, right? Using the best of each of the other models to kind of build a model which, in theory, would, would, would be better. Um, so technically, how would you do that? Well, at the discovery point, um, oh, and like if you look at the previous slide, it said it's a, it's a simple honeypot. So I can't, I can't stress how simple it actually is. Um, I'm a really bad coder. I'm actually more of a really bad scripter. Um, like people have asked, like, oh, what do you use to code? Like, the, uh, I use duct tape coding, right? Where I'll do some little bit in Perl because I know how a socket works in Perl, and I'll just pipe that to something in Python because I'm lazy and that's how I code. So when I say simple, I'm not, I mean like properly, properly simple. Um, so to do the discovery phase and to, and to stick with the honeypot type principle, I built this thing to just have listening sockets, right? Had a little Perl script, opened up some sockets, and opened up on port. Uh, 135, 139, uh, 3389, 445, and 443 and 80. So basically RPC control ports, uh, remote desktop, and HTTP. Um, so yeah, the listening daemon just did that, and then I had some anti-spoofing anti controls in it as well. So only TCP, no UDP, um, and then I did some uh, SYN cookies, and did some rate limiting, rate limiting, so make sure you couldn't brute force the SYN cookies either. Um, and then on the action side, I, I basically just said that if I see something and I know, and I know it's malicious because I'm, I'm effectively a honeypot and I'm sitting on a, on a piece of unused space, um, if I see an IP address, I'm just going to send it to the firewall. I'm going to send it to the upstream enforcer and tell it to block it off. So by doing that, I've taken the, um, the, the really efficient action parts from a detection model and the really efficient discovery part from a presence model and just like linked them together into one like hybrid model, right? Um, logically, pla I mean, yeah, logically placed, would sit in a farm with other, other web servers like it would a normal honeypot um, and just keep its ports open. The only problem was that's a production environment, how it sat there, the production environment I was working on. And I thought it was a bit of an ask to ask the, the admins of the environment to just like, you know, take this feed of IP addresses I'm sending you and just block them off the firewall. Like, don't worry about it, just, just, just trust me about it, right? So I had a problem where I really couldn't test, test the idea uh, because I couldn't risk uh, interfering with the actual network. So I built a ancillary system, which you'll see on the side there is the packet, the packet capture node, right? Um, it had one port going into the, into the amber honeypot, and it would basically just be fed with the IP addresses that the honeypot picked up through the listening daemon. Um, and then it had a, a wiretap linked to a span port at the router level. And it would just PCAP the entire segment data down. Um, the idea was that if I could peek at the entire environment data, I could replay the entire um, traffic load of the previous day. Um, and I would then, um, obviously in my Nirvana mind, I would take um, the IP addresses I found in the honeypot, I would check them against the PCAP, and I'd say, cool, I saw an IP address at this time, and if I see in that, that same IP address uh, attacking any of the other servers later down, um, I would know it's working, right? If I, if I was in a position to, act, to have a firewall which I could access, um, I would have prevented those accesses going down. The problem was, when you peak up a segment like that, I was logging about 200 gigs a day. Um, and then you learn cool lessons, like uh, Wireshark is really, really shitty for doing mass backup analysis, like really bad. To the point where I, where I was trying to, trying to run through um, 
a 200 gig packet capture, it would take me more than 24 hours to find an, a single IP address on that list. Um, and I actually wrote a, a lot of tools around that type of stuff where I had a, um, um, I discovered that if you take Wireshark and you start adding conditionals to the end of it, so instead of saying, uh, you know, Wireshark, try and find this IP address. If I said, find this IP address or this IP address, and every IP address I had in my list, it would take the same amount of time because the IO, the disk, it takes long, and then running through was, was, was pretty easy. I also discovered the maximum you can do on Wireshark is 5,000 conditional loops before it just tells you the fuck off. Um, I also wrote a little parallel, 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 parallel processing script in Python for, for Wireshark because Wireshark is single-threaded. Um, and it basically just launched the Wireshark against the different files and would recycle them as they, as they open up again. Just to try and get it down to a point where it wasn't taking me longer to analyze the, analyze the files that I was doing over a one day's packet capture. Anyway, got to a point where it was efficient enough to actually start working. And I saw that for every IP address I would, that, that the Honeypot was capturing, I would see that same IP address accessing another, um, another system on the network between six and seven times, right? At which point I declared victory. Because right there, if I had access to it, and um, if I had access to a firewall, and I was blocking these things when, when the honeypot saw them, I would prevent another seven accesses into the network. Um, which would, you know, it's, not, it's not guaranteed there would be like 100% exploit, but it does cut down the amount of like malicious noise coming into the network. So to summarize, you know, building a hybrid screen model is possible, and it, you can make it that it is functional. Um, and, I could, and you could build a very simple honeypot with that model, model in mind. Um, and then, you know, some things are easier to accomplish when you have the right tools, and Wireshark is almost never the tool when you're doing it on a, on a distributed level, on a, on a big data level. <clears throat> so, like, I had that, I, ha I had my first, my first big victory, right? And I thought, cool, man, like, I've got a honeypot, I've got this model, it's working well, what can I do now, right? And I thought, you know, maybe I can have like, if I have like a bunch of distributed nodes, you know, I'll get like, um, uh, I'll deploy one in America, I'll deploy one in Germany, in Singapore, in Australia, uh, in South America, and um, they'll all like collect data together and I get this like big, this big view, right? And I had this idea of this like threat tsunami, you know? And as, as like these things roll in over time zones, you'll see like the same IP producers collecting across and they'll hit something in Australia, then they'll hit something uh, in, in the UK and... Um, I had this like whole thing mapped on my head. It's going to be amazing, right? Um, so I did that. I, I, I bought um, I bought two VPSs to, to supplement the one I had in, in South Africa already. Uh, one in Germany and one in America, um, for the pure reason that it's very cheap to buy stuff in America and Germany. And I was funding this myself, so um, I ended up having three three of these little amber nodes, and I started collecting data, right? So after nine months. Um, I had like 2,800 IPs logged on the South African one, 1,100 in the German one, and 10,000 addresses logged by the, by the um, American one. And I said, cool, man, let me take these addresses and start mapping across like how often, they, how often the IP address appears in a separate node, what the time differences are, and um, I start building this like this threat tsunami, right? Um, so who wants, to, who wants to hazard the guess of what the correlation rate was on average between all three nodes? You said 3%. Give a, uh, right, Matt, go run and give Adam a shot. <laughs> you said zero over here? So then, yeah, I suppose there's no surprise that it was an absolute zero correlation rate, right? Of the 14,000 addresses I collected over those nine periods, I only saw four IPs that appeared in all three of them, um, which is a little bit disheartening because I was really looking forward to this threat tsunami, right? I had like a lot riding on it. So I thought, let me take the 16,000 addresses from openbl.org, right? And what openbl does is they, um, they have a bunch of, of listening nodes, very similar, they also, they also collect IP addresses, but it's more, it's also they have um, known spammers, um, uh, bots, uh, and they basically have this list, and you can choose a, like, what the period is. So I took the 360-day one, which is like close to the close to the time span I was looking at, um, and I followed that into the data set as well. And 
Who wants to guess what the correlation went up to then? Say again. So zero. <laughs> Matt, can you give the man a shot glass as well? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, zero. So the main thing I learned from that was IP-based threat feeds mean absolutely nothing. Like, and, and even if you spend, okay, so people like IP-based threat feeds because they're easy, right? You simply get the feed, you plug it into a control, and it does, it works, right? But based on that, that research alone, even if it takes you a minute to do that, you're wasting that minute. You should be doing something else, right? You should be drinking. Um, because there's zero value on using just straight IP address type stuff, right? Um, but the other thing is that I was kind of left high and dry because now I didn't have any, my, my entire hypothesis had fallen apart. You know? I was counting on a threat tsunami um, to show some cool research after this. Um, so I kind of felt like this, right? <laughs> I don't know why this person's running naked, but. Uh, I mean, completely defeated, right? And I kind of like let down by my, by my own hubris about like how, how grand it was going to be, right? Um, which leads me to what the actual topic of this talk is about, right? I got to a point where I had a lot of data, um, and a lot of data which kind of ended up being very irrelevant and very useless to me. But I still had this data, and I was, I was convinced there was something good to do with this data, right? I could take this data and make something make something useful out of it, have some value, affirm that I hadn't wasted nine months of my life. Um, so I, I was in, I've been working a lot on, um, on uh, some, some big data stuff to the side of this. Um, I'm not going to talk about big data, so don't worry. Don't, don't leave the room just yet. Um, but like the whole concept of, of MapReduce and how you basically group things and then make different, different um, look at them differently um, was kind of in my mind. So I thought... What if I take the data and I, I look at it differently, right? If I kind of change my view on the data I had. Um, so what I had from the honeypot was the source IP address of the connecting host, the destination port, where it connected to, and the time, right? I mean, I said simple honeypot, so no, nothing fancy beyond those three things. And I thought, with those three things, what could I do? How could I kind of, how could I try and coax some more value out of this data? And... Um, the one obvious one was I thought, well, let me try and geolocate the IP addresses, right? Let me try and factor them into something that's a bigger set, something that's maybe a bit more common, and based on that, maybe I can see something else happening. So I did that. Geolocate the IP addresses um, to countries. Um, because you, you can geolocate to, like, cities and suburbs, but the accuracy is quite low, and you lose a lot of... I mean, you can get to countries about 99% of the time, um, whereas if you go to, like, like distinct points like a building in China somewhere, uh, it doesn't, it's very unlikely to get the, the accuracy. So I kind of grouped all the IP addresses based on country um, across all three nodes, right? I got something like that. So there, there were 105, between 100 and 110 countries for every single node, and this is the snippet of, of the top 10 countries per node, right? Um, where Taiwan it was, the, was the most prevalent country to attack, to attack, to access the honeypot on the American node, uh, and China was the highest for both South Africa and, and, the, and the German node. But what's interesting about this data set, right, if you start looking at how they actually fill up, there's like a lot of Brazil going on there as well, and like a lot of Germany as well. Um, so there's, there's, there's certain commonalities in the data sets just based on countries alone. Um, so if you just look at the top one and said, yeah, China knew that, nothing new, move on, it doesn't, it's not that helpful. But by kind of looking at like the, the bigger picture and looking across the nodes, there is like a different story being told here, right? So I said, that's interesting. What if I take that and I kind of score them based on where they sit in every single node? Um, the idea was like, let's say I have an enterprise, right? And I've, got, I've got three campuses. I've got a, a, a local South African campus, a German campus, and an American campus, right? And I have one node in each of those campuses. Um, and they have kind of shown me this. This is, this is like what their like, top 10 connecting countries were. And if I take that list and I combine them and I score them, where, um, like this example, 10 is like the most dangerous, so like Taiwan and China each get 10 on those nodes, and I score all the countries down and I, and I add them up and I combine them. And you can take a bigger table like that, right? As you can see at the bottom, China's got 25, as a score, um, 
because it was the top in two of the, two of the, two of the nodes and then in the middle of the last node, right? Um, and the numbers are arbitrary, right? The numbers don't really matter, but it's about like grouping them together and then deciding as things, scale, as things slide down the scale, they become a bit more malicious. Um, but because you're making such heavy assumptions, you can't just go and say, all right, China's, China's obviously attacking me. Let's just block all the Chinese traffic coming into my, into my network, right? Or, you know, like Brazil attacking me a little bit less, let's block 80% of the Brazilian traffic coming into the, into the, into the um, network. So I decided, not, instead of taking such a hard line about things, if you start using it as, as, a, as a supplement to your signature system, right? So if you look at Snort, um, and you look at this system, right? And because this is real time, and it's, it's all automated, right? There's no research behind it. You can just basically just pump it through a bunch of scripts, and you get this type of stuff on a, on a per day, per hour limit. You can basically say then, given this data, let me pump signatures into my Snort that, that say, cool, like, Today, I can see there's a lot of Chinese traffic coming over the last 30 days, right? So if you see a connection from China, like let's bump the threshold like a little bit, right? Let's get like a plus two to the, to the, to the scoring, right? So that you, you're adding some weight to, your, uh, to your, the rest of your controls already. Um, and you basically take that and you go out all the way up, right? So you say, so give, give China plus 2.5, right? And if it's from Brazil, give it a plus 2.1. And you can decide if you want to go up all the way or like top three or top five or whatever, right? But this type of stuff gives you, gives you an, uh, a way of supporting your controls with some degree of um, orientation to what's happening to your network. So then that was the first step, right? Then I said, what else can I do, right? I have port. I, I still have the, the, the source port, I mean the destination port that the IP address is connected to. So, Here's a graph of the South African node and the top 10 countries. So the same graph from before, but now you've got the, the, the amounts of the connections coming in, right? And you can see again, China, top of the list there. But if I overlay what the um, destination port was for all those connections, you know, 70% of the traffic that was coming from a, Ch a Chinese um, geolocated IP address was trying to connect to port 3389. Um, so just in that, that information alone, you can say, okay, cool, well, if I get a connection from China and it's on port 3389, it's probably a little bit worse based on just a simple system. So you can kind of use that and give it a, a higher threshold as well. So, I mean, it's very possible that you have connections coming from China on port 3389, right? I mean, depending on what your business is, what you do. But if you are really collecting data where a large portion of um, malicious attacks are coming in onto an asset which you know doesn't have any business use, and it's mostly using... RDP, and it's from China, you can quite safely say that you should kind of look at these things a bit more suspiciously, all right? Going back to, to Bill's quote. So the idea, again, is not to like just block off RDP from China, but to kind of give it a more significant bump in your scoring, in your signature scoring system. So that if you have like a seam, um, and you are basically using a, a, a threshold system to kind of decide when things get, get elevated and alert, like that kind of would, would add into that whole system, right? If you look at the other nodes, um, so this is the, Amer the German node, it also has China as the top, top of the list, right? But once you overlay ports, it's a bit of a different story. I mean, 3389 is there, but it's almost a near perfect split with uh, RPC. So, what I, what I started seeing here was that every single, every node had a different view of what was happening to its network, and it wasn't the same across those nodes when, once you go to the port level. So it's, it's really hard to kind of say, you know, German attackers are using RPC across the board and that's kind of what you should be watching out for. But if you have something localized on your network and you can pull this kind of data in a very easy way, um, you can start making some, some more intelligent decisions around how you start adding to your signatures. And here you can say that if it's from China and it's on 3389 and it's on, or it's on 445, I'm, more, I'm a little bit more um, suspicious about that type of traffic. And just like further highlight that, on the American node, mostly Taiwanese traffic, followed very closely by American traffic, and it was predominantly RPC traffic. <clears throat> so the things I learned, right, through this, this nine months of running into cactuses, that honeypots are really useful tools, right? They don't get used a lot, and I think it's because they're very different and they have a, they're associated with a very heavy cost to implement. Um, but they're really useful because they are so different in how they work. Um, 
You know I mean, if, if you just look at virus total, how many different types of antivirus you can throw at network and how many different firewalls there are. But at the end of the day, it's all kind of the same type of stuff, right? But the honeypot is a different view. And it's not saying it's better or worse. It's just different. Um, and I think just because of that difference, there's a great deal of value about them. Um, you can get yourself in trouble making assumptions or making hypotheses about things, um, which is a big lesson I learned for myself. Um, and then there's more to date than just the raw elements, right? Just looking at the raw IP addresses and the raw ports really didn't do anything in this, in this research for me. Only once I got to a point where I started factorizing stuff into groups of things and then making decisions on that, that's why I started getting use, useful information about us. Um, and then lastly, I, building, stuff, building your own stuff gives you a very um, high degree of relevance to your network. Like in the previous slides in the bar charts where every single node had a very different pattern to what was coming into it, um, you could, by building your own stuff, you can kind of add those relevances into it. I always, I always look, at, look at threat feeds, right? Because I, I deal with like threat intelligence stuff. And I look at the threat feed and like they just publish things down to you, okay? And it's really hard to draw actionable intelligence from it, right? It's like a massive buzzword as well. Like how do you draw actionable stuff from those type of things? But if you build it yourself and you deploy it on your own network and it's based on what your network's seeing, I mean that actionable stuff is almost pulled right, right off the equation because you can say it's right there, you know? It's actionable because it's right there. And with that, um, I'll let uh, Cyborg, Cyborg Unicorn Space Pirate find Cthulhu prompt you for questions. Yeah, man. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, if there's a question, I drink, yeah. <laughs> Matt's rules, man, sorry. So, uh, really good presentation. In fact, it's quite interesting that honeypots are starting to come back again. You know, you're seeing a resurgence of them. Um, I've been building a very similar thing using um, Raspberry Pi and uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, honeypot uh, projects on that and using it as reputation analysis in my SIEM with correlation rules. Very, very cool. Um, so... Uh, with your with your work, are you, have you started to publish the code out to um, allow people to to actually grab your simple honeypot? Um, I've been asked this before, and like I probably will never release the code for this because right. it is written so badly. Um, it's actually, <laughs> it's embarrassing to have it published somewhere. You're concerned about the mocking. <laughs> <laughs> I am very concerned about the mocking. Yes, so much that I'll openly say it's written so badly. Um, but the code really isn't important. I mean. The best, piece of code, the best piece of code I wrote in this whole thing was um, the Python script that paralyzed, I mean, that parallel virtualized the, um, the, um, the script, the bash script stuff. Um, but the honeypot really is, it's seven lines long. And it's just open socket, here's the port, here's the port, log to farm, that's it. It really isn't more than that. So, I mean, I thought I'd publish the IP addresses, but I don't see the point in that either because you're better off collecting your own information um, instead of having another set of random IP addresses from a random space, you know? Yeah. Um, so like, I thought about publishing, publishing the code, but it's, it's so simple, and I don't feel like being mocked. Yeah, I think the value is probably less in the code, more in the correlation rules that, uh, that people could use. So you know, pick the top five SEMs and give, give examples of that. I think that would be really useful. Oh, yeah, man. I'll, yeah. I'll, that's a good idea, actually. I'll look at doing that. That's a, that's yeah. a cool idea. Thanks. Cool. Any more questions? Yeah. Well, you need a question. <laughs> My question is with regarding to your cor correlation rate. Um, did you try to first weed out the, the known IP addresses of those, oh, thanks, the, um, the known uh, bots that crawling the internet or, or not? Um, I didn't, I, I, I kind of, as part of the threat tsunami plan, right, I kind of had like these, those type of rules, but I can't, because it got to a point where there was just no similar stuff, um, all those things ran aground. So I, I didn't explore any of, any of the research that related to those type of things, like, like I said, crossing into no malicious ASNs or into um, like uh, what's considered bulletproof hosting. Or, like, there, were, like, there was plans to do that stuff, but because I couldn't see any IPs being similar, um, those things kind of fell away straight away, straight, away, straight away. I mean, those type of research angles just fell away. So I haven't looked at it at all. Well, because what I mean surprises me is that uh, the correlation you mentioned was zero, right? You should at least pick up some correlation for some of the known uh, 
known bots like Shodan or Shadow Server, which, I mean, what I'm observing on a daily basis, they scan your nodes. So there should be some correlation there at least. So being zero is kind of, it doesn't really make sense to me. And I, I, think, I think because um, they collect in a scale beyond what I was collecting, right? So I, was, I wasn't trying to leverage off an external feed because I kind of wanted to control how the feed was coming into it and where it was placed and the conditions that the feed was being captured. Um, because it's very easy just to, to, to buy a feed from share, or to use a feed from, from share server, right? Um, but I was really trying to see what, what I can do based on what the timings were and having your own bots, what you could do from that point of view. So um, I agree with you. If I, if I had crossed with, or if, if I had folded into those sets, I probably would have seen a lot, a lot higher correlation. Um, but I was really trying to focus on a, on a homegrown solution and what you could do with your own type of intelligence. Uh, China was top one country, but did you realize it's also the biggest country in, in the world? <laughs> so that's a very good point, right? So w when you do these things, there's certain social, social political, and um, infrastructural economics you've got to take into, take into regard as well. So um, to give an example, if I saw a connection from Uganda, right, and it's one, how do you weight that compared to seeing a thousand connections from China? I mean, surely there's more than the contention ratio between PCs in China and Uganda is more than 1,000 to 1, right? Um, so I didn't take it into consideration, but it's, it was part of like my further research to kind of look into that type of stuff. Um, and there's lots you can do because um, there's, a, there's raw size, right? And there's population density because computers don't use themselves. Just because the country's big doesn't mean there's computers. So you have to look at the density size. And then you can kind of also have to fold in um, uh, speed into that, right? So like I saw a lot of attacks from America, not because I think America is a malicious country, but because, I mean, a large portion of the internet lives in America, and hosting is very cheap in America. So if hosting is cheap in America, anyone can get hosting. And the same with Germany. So a lot of people get hosting from America and Germany because it's cheap. And if it's cheap, you don't really care so much about security, so you deploy your, your, your WordPress site and you leave it. Um, so you, you, there's, there's a big question around that type of stuff, I agree with you. Um, I didn't look at it. Um, and it's on the, the future roadmap to do. But it, it's, when you're doing these type of things, there, there's definitely those type of questions to ask. So it should be, seeing a connection from Uganda, one connection should be more important than 10,000 from China. Exactly. Yeah. And, and regarding to him, the, the crawlers, you had South Africa, something in Europe, and something in America. So yeah. I think they use different data centers for the crawling. That's why the IP addresses didn't match. Did you do any correlation of which countries connected the least to your honeypots and um, had the number of countries that you actually had there? Was there anyone uh, in, did the Pope visit your honeypot or uh, Vatican City? <laughs> <laughs> I think it could be funny to add to the presentation it also. Actually, it's, it's a very good point. I, I didn't look at um, at least. Um, what was quite interesting is like, I think it was between, yeah, 110 and 100, between 100 and 110 across all nodes, right? So there was a lot of connections from a lot of countries. Um, I haven't got the data with me on this machine, so I can't, see, I can't look up many what, what the least ones were. Um, but just based on, those, on those, those counts, right, it would seem to be quite across a lot of countries. I didn't check if the Vatican came. Um, I'll, when I go home, I'll find out, and I'll, 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 do a, I'll publish a post about it, definitely. I'll do a tweet about it. <laughs> Thanks, that's a really good idea. Yeah, I, so maybe I'm wrong, but um, I think that the geolocation is an irrelevance. Um, it's more about reputation and analysis uh, of the IP. So I don't care if it's from Uganda or China or America. It's more whether that's been directed towards my actual honeypot. And so you know, spending more time analyzing that irrelevant of country, I think would probably give you better results. So like one of the approaches I took was any system that touched my honeypot um, on, let's say Kippo as an, as an example. So anything that SSH to my, my network, the reputation, allow, the reputation of that IP address dropped dramatically. And if it was China, yeah, that's quite interesting. But in reality, somebody's SSH to my machine and I don't, I don't care where they are. So yeah, 
what are your thoughts on that? You know, do, do you think do you, I'm interested to know why you, you know, the geolocation was so important to you? So the geolocation allowed you allowed me to move away from the raw IP address um, and to look at a, a, a higher level, um, and it allowed me to do certain generalization rules um, and then not to make hard decisions based on that, um, which I th I, I couldn't do an IP address, right? So I had to group it somehow. Um, I disagree with you that there's no value in geolocation um, in the in the sense that and back to the, like the Ugandan example, if you The probability of a compromised machine being in Uganda is lower, just on raw numbers opposed to America, right? So, and like I'm, I'm just, there's no, I don't think, I haven't got any data to back this up, but if I see something like attack me from that point of view, it might be more targeted than just the run of the mill type of stuff. Um, that's my thinking, I could be wrong. Um, but I think it's definitely worth, it, worth investigating more than just another connection from a, a very well populated um, uh, geolocation. But I, understand, I see what you're saying about it being irrelevant because it's already on your side, right? Um, and the geolocation became important when you're trying to have multiple data sets together. That, that's what my use really was for it, from multiple locations combining data sets. Have you tried uh, correlating your data against ASNs? So I ASN. Um, I have not, and it was also on my roadmap of things to do. Um, there was another reason why I didn't do ASNs, but I can't remember it right now. No, I remember. <laughs> I actually had to, yeah, Wim asked me the same question a couple of months ago, and uh, that's I was something I was meant to do. I haven't looked at it directly, um, but I'm actually I'm working on, on, on a second generation of this um, that captures a little bit more data than just the, like, the, the IP address. Um, some, not a full, full pack capture, but like, a, like, I don't know, like maybe a meg of incoming data is bit bit much as well. Um, and with that, with that new data set, but the same idea of trying to like, uh, transform through the data instead of taking on face value, um, I'm looking and trying to see how that, how that affects it. And then I'll do ASN, and then I'll do um, um, like what headers come through at the very first, being any like raw bytes, things like that, timings as well. So it's on my map as well, thanks. Did you check for, um, oh, here, sorry. Sorry, thanks. Yeah. Did you check for um, uh, Tor exit nodes, uh, VPN uh, known uh, exit nodes, and, and, and that kind of traffic? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, I would have, if there were common nodes, I would have checked for those type of things to make sure I wasn't just labeling something as being a, um, a common point of access because it was simply Tor. Um, so I didn't, I didn't check because I didn't think there was that much value in labeling things as being Tor networks. Cool. Uh, did you lose any honeypots while uh, running the test of nine months? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, um, the likelihood of me losing them was more about me breaking them myself somehow, um, <laughs> because because they weren't they weren't high interaction honeypots, right? So the stack wasn't that wasn't that um, involved, uh, so there wasn't any real vulnerability into it. I mean, at worst, someone could actually uh, I have this slide about Bernie really talk about. So in the the portions, there's like the listening daemon, and then there was the the enforcer. Above that was a watchdog script that kind of sat, and the watchdog script was was um, sta uh, made uh, as a state machine and it checked what state the honeypot was in. If the honeypot wasn't in its active state, it would nuke the entire thing and rebuild it from the ground up because it was so simple. Um, so, but that never actually, ha it happened when I rebooted the machine and the, and the thing was a bit, they were trying to figure out where in what state it was, but I never saw them coming directly under any attack. <laughs> I'm just also wondering um, if you checked any like, web application attacks or something, because if you look at your top um, country, China, in a few cases, it's, okay, you see some SMB traffic, but that's blocked on your firewall anyways. So while it's cool, what's the value of learning that? 
Um, so I didn't look at web stuff because the honeypot was too simple to have any kind of like, like web stack around something. Um, but and I'll answer your question now. Give me a second. Um, So I agree with you, right? The stuff I was looking for was, is blocked up at the firewall level normally, right? But it's more about is something trying to access a, something which is obviously vulnerable on my system, right? So an IP is coming at me on, four, four, on 445, right? Shouldn't be, so why? So but on that decision alone, you could say, like look at the scan, right? If, if, if someone scans a, uh, scans a block um, with a straight, like straightforward MAP scan, they're gonna hit that honeypot on 445 at some point. And based on that alone, you can say, cool, lock them off. Um, it's more for like, a, it kind of stops the information gathering type of stuff. The, I mean, this is never going to stop an advanced attack, right? Because it's, it's outside the network, it has no, um, no web front end, doesn't look at any of like, anything like that. But I think if someone is, try, is, is poking around your subnet, it will, find, it will look at that type, it will find that type of stuff. Cool. I think we have time anyway. Yep, time is up. So thank you, Adam, for a presentation. Cool.